Ball State Fullerton are the champions of college baseball. The 2021 season will mark Monty Lee's sixth at the helm of the Clemson Tigers program and his 13th overall as a head coach. In four seasons at Clemson, Lee averaged 42 wins and led the Tigers to four NCAA tournament appearances. In 12 seasons as a head coach, including seven at the College of Charleston, Lee has a 458 and 231 overall record. Lee reached 200 wins faster than any coach in school history at the College of Charleston to go along with four NCAA appearances and a Super Regional in 2014. Lee was an assistant at South Carolina under Ray Tanner for six seasons, helping guide the Gamecocks to four Super Regional bursts and trips to the College World two trips to the College World Series. He began his coaching career as an assistant at Spartanburg Methodist, where the 2001 team competed in the NJCA College World Series. Please welcome to the stage, Monty Lee. First and foremost, I'd like to thank um, all the coaches that I've had a chance to work with in the past and, and all of my colleagues. It's truly an honor to be here today uh, speaking amongst uh, all of the coaches that are members of the ABCA. It's been a lifelong dream of mine to be here and be able to present on the main stage, and it is truly an honor. Uh, my talk today uh, is on hitting and in, in what my mind is the four building blocks of offense of developing the individual hitter along with um, your team uh, from an offensive standpoint. Uh, we're going to talk about four different phases of offense, which is the movement patterns that we want to promote daily uh, with their, with their warm-up, um, their movement patterns into cages, um, our approach to hitting with no strikes, one strike, and two strikes, uh, timing, and the three phases of timing, the initial move, the forward move, and rotation, and then the practice environment on the field, how we challenge the hitter daily in the practice environment. So uh, don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. In movement, we think that it is critical for the athlete to understand how to set up in an athletic position. Some of the key components that you see here uh, with our baseball players, with our hitters, when they set up in the box, we want their knees and their shoulders square. You should be able to draw an imaginary square from their shoulders and their knees. We want their hip line to be hinged. If you look at the view from the pitcher there, our player has his eyes slightly over his toes, and the bridge of his nose is to the pitcher. This is very, very important. A hitter has a dominant eye. Oftentimes, if he's a right-handed thrower and a right-handed hitter, his back eye is his dominant eye. We want to make sure that he has that eye looking straight ahead towards the pitcher. If a hitter can shut his front eye and see the bridge of his nose, his eyes are not square to the pitcher. So it is critical that he hinges at the hip line, gets his eyes out over his toes where he can see the baseball, and that his shoulders and his knees are square so that he can move freely in the box and work the barrel of the bat in a south-to-north fashion when he swings the bat. One of the major things that we talk about and when we evaluate our hitters is do they load into their quad or do they load into their hips? You'll see in this video here, the player on the left is loading into his quad. He is shifting his weight back towards the catcher. His knee is getting over his rear foot. He is losing balance as he loads. And when he moves forward, he will struggle with timing, he will struggle with balance, and he will struggle with swing adjustability. If you look at the player on the right, this is what we call a hip load. He is essentially hinging down to the ground and striding forward. There is no back shift in his load whatsoever. He loads down into the ground, hinging his hips down and striding forward. This is a better timing move, a more athletic move, and this hitter will have a high level of adjustability. A couple things to look for, too, in your hitters is when they load and stride, 
Look for a player who loads into his quad. <clears throat> his belt line will be uneven as he strides forward. If a hitter loads into his hips and loads in and not back, his belt line will be even as he strides forward. This creates a more dynamic move and a, a much more highly adjustable swing. This is the difference that we, st we see in still images with a player who loads into his quad. If you look at the player on the left, as he shifts back over his backside and not into his backside, as he moves forward, <clears throat> excuse me, his belt line will be uneven. Most players who load in this fashion and move forward in this fashion, again, will have swing adjustability issues. The player that, that hinges at the hip line and strides forward will have an even belt line. This player will have a much more adjustable swing to different pitches in the strike zone. How do we warm the player up? How do we promote the right movement patterns in our warm-up series? We begin with the farm board. This is a product that I got from, uh, from the guys at 108. Joey Kuna, great hitting guy, shared this with me. We use it daily with our warm-up routine and in the cages when we hit. <clears throat> it's essentially the feel is the player is hitting on ice. How can he stay grounded in an uneven environment underneath him. He has to maintain his rear foot into the ground as he moves forward, and the player will naturally have a slight scissor kick if he does this correctly. Why do we throw the med ball off the farm board? We want the hitter to rotate through his trunk and block his front side and not spin on his feet, which is a common problem we see with hitters. So we have the player stand on the farm board. He holds a med ball, a small med ball, right in line with his trunk. He loads back, and then he fires forward and tries to maintain his foot position on the farm board. Really like this drill for warm-up and also to promote the right movement patterns for the hitter. Our next one, this product is made by Ultimate Instability. It is an aqua bag. We load the aqua bag about halfway with water. And what you see the player doing here is he's going to hold the aqua bag at his chest. Both heels have to be connected to the ground. We do not allow the hitter to spin on his feet. And he's just rotating through his trunk without his shoulders turning. We want to disassociate the hips and the shoulders and have the, the hitter understand how to rotate through the trunk and then fire the bat. We do not want the shoulders to turn when the trunk is turning. The hands are the last thing that fires in the swing. Our next drill with the aqua bag is what we call a linear bag swing. It promotes a south to north bat path. It also promotes a positive forward move towards the pitcher. And we think this is, again, a great warm-up tool that promotes good movement patterns for the hitter. Our last warm-up is the Aqua Ball. Same company, Ultimate Instability, makes it. We fill it up with water, and the hitter will fight to rotate. We don't want him to rotate. We want him to fire up his core, activate his core, and strengthen his core. This is a great precursor to going into the cages and hitting. It really activates the body and the part of the body that we want to focus on the most with the swing, which is the trunk. Now we're going to go into our drills that we do with our hitters. All of our drills are done with side toss. We sit in a chair at a 45-degree angle in line uh, slightly in front of the front hip of the hitter, and we throw BP from 10 steps into cages or roughly 25 feet daily. We do not use the underhand front flip in our drill series, and we do not hit off of the tee, and there's many reasons for this. Number one, we don't like the front flip to be an underhand flip because no pitcher in America throws from that angle, and we don't like our guys to hit off a tee because the last time I checked, you're not going to hit a stationary ball in the game. We want to see the ball come from an overhand throw, that's why if instead of a front flip, we'll square up to the hitter and we will throw at 10 steps away from him so he's getting a downhill angle with every ball he hits and a moving ball so that he can time up and sync up his swing with the pitcher. We believe in hitting a moving ball. The drills that we do in the cages after we warm up, we use the farm board. We like to bat between the feet drill, a yoga block drill, 
heavy bat drills, BOSU balls, and our rope drill. And I'll go through those real quickly with you. The first drill that we have here is what we call the rope drill. This is a 70-foot rope with a PVC pipe, a three-quarter inch PVC pipe. And a good friend of mine, Jeff Edwards with Swing Builder, he is a tremendous follow on Twitter. If you're a hitting enthusiast, he shared this drill with me, and we use it daily. And again, what is it promoting here? When the hitter swings this rope, it is instant feedback as if he has a direct path back to the pitcher. The rope will wave in a straight line all the way back to the pitcher, and he gets feedback if his swing is working east to west or west to east, which is around the strike zone, or south to north directly through the middle of the plate back to the pitcher, which is a more linear path and a direct path to the ball. Our next drill I'm a big fan of is we swing heavy bats daily. This is a 38-38 made by Big Time Bat. They also make a 40-40 and a 36-36. We use all of them depending upon the strength uh, of the hitter. Why do we use the, the, the heavy bat? You have to swing a heavy bat with your whole body. If the hitter is very pushy with his hands and swings on top of his shoulders, he'll have adjustability issues and contact depth issues. The heavy bat promotes the swing underneath the shoulders, the barrel will stay in the bat a longer period of time, and your contact point has to be farther out front with the heavy bat to hit the ball hard. We feel like this teaches the hitter how to swing the bat properly without talking a lot about mechanics, which is the point of our drills. We want our hitters to move correctly without talking about swing mechanics. Our next drill, one of my personal favorites, and our players absolutely love it, is the BOSU ball drill. We have the hitter stand on both BOSU balls. They have to be connected into the ground. They have to be dynamic and athletic. On the BOSU balls, if they do not have good balance and they're not athletic enough to maintain their balance, they'll fall right off the BOSU balls. Uh, the hitter will naturally scissor his back foot. You can see it in the swing here because he's so connected to the ground that his swing will sequence from the ground up by hitting on the BOSU balls. This is an excellent bat path drill. The player will hit many more line drives in the middle of the field when standing on the BOSU ball because he's so connected to the ground and so dynamic in his movement pattern. This is a very similar drill to the BOSU ball, an old school drill, bat between the feet. Again, it promotes the hitter being balanced and connected to the ground. And again, very similar drill to the BOSU ball. If you don't have BOSU balls, you can do this daily with your hitters so that they can feel the correct bat path and sequence in their swing. Yoga block. This again is a Joey Kuna drill. I love this drill. My guys absolutely love doing this drill. This is a front foot drill where they're going to put their foot on a yoga block. And what it primarily helps our hitters feel is that vertical load versus a horizontal load. A load into the ground, hinging into the hip line, and a forward move versus a horizontal load where they're loading into their quad and shifting back towards the catcher. So putting the foot on the yoga block, they have to load down into the ground and then have a positive stride forward to hit the baseball. We really like this drill, and we do it a lot daily. And then we finish with the farm board. We hit off the farm board on a daily basis. We even have some hitters hit off two farm boards at one time. But again, we want the rear foot to stay connected to the ground as he moves forward. The hitter will naturally scissor when he does this, and it promotes a good bat path and a good sequence in the swing. Last but not least, we have to incorporate what we do in the weight room uh, to promote good movement patterns. We don't do a straight bar squat anymore. Why? We use a safety bar squat for all our lunge series and our squat series because it promotes a hinging at the hip line and a braced core, which we're looking for when we swing the bat. If you barbell squat, it's a chest out position, which is not as athletic a move. We believe that the safety bar squat promotes hinging at the hip line, bracing the core in an athletic position. 
We also use the Hungarian Core Blaster, which is a plate-loaded hip hinge and balance drill to strengthen the hip line. It's essentially a very, very heavy kettlebell swing. You can see here one of our players doing a very heavy Hungarian Core Blaster swing. Again, just promoting a good hip hinge. He's in a very athletic balance position. And he's strengthening the muscle patterns and the movements that we're looking for with our hitters. Now we're going to move into approach. All coaches want to ask about approach. How do you teach the approach to hitting with no strikes, one strike, two strike? This is how we teach the approach uh, to, uh, to the swing with our hitters. The first thing I would tell you, the best hitting coach you have is the top bar of the L screen. Anytime our, get, our hitters get out of sequence or out of whack, we immediately get external and we talk to the guys about trying to hit a good hard line drive through the top bar of the L screen. That promotes good timing, good balance, good swing path, all things that are good for a hitter. The top bar of the L screen is the best feedback you have when it comes to if your hitters are on time and have a good swing. We use the top bar of the L screen as our external cue daily. How many balls can you hit hard? One of the first things we talk about with our guys in our damage approach, which is our no-strike approach, and our gap-to-gap -gap approach, which is our one-strike approach, is how many balls can you cover and hit hard? Out of seven balls that will cross the plate, most guys will tell you they can cover three to four and hit them very hard. If you look at our plate here, we use the tape plates, which is a ball and a half in off the corner and a ball and a half in off the outside corner. And we put tape down. This is from Link Jarrett, by the way. He deserves credit for this. He shared this with me many years ago, and I really like it. That lane in the middle of the plate is our no strike and our one strike approach. We want to cover four baseballs. You can also see the compass idea that I use a lot with hitters of promoting the south to north bat path. We want the barrel of the bat working through from a south to north path. So let's get into our approaches. The damage approach, our external cue is our field. We want for a right-handed hitter, if you look at this, this diagram here, everything works off the fastball. We must be on time to his best fastball. We're looking for a pitch within four baseballs, and we want to hit the baseball from the right center gap to the pull side line. A good swing and a damage count, is if we were to tell a pitcher, I want you to put it on a tee for me. This is where I want the baseball. That's where we look for the baseball with no strikes. It doesn't matter if it's 0-0, 1-0, 2-0, or 3-0. Put it on a tee approach. That is our damage approach. And if you execute your swing, it should result in an extra base hit from this middle of the field to the pull side line. We cut the field in half. Okay, that we are never late with our no strike approach and we take our best swing on our pitch in this approach with no strikes. Our base approach is our gap to gap approach. We have hitters that will use the gap to gap approach in their no strike and their one strike approach. The focus and timing with one strike is no different than our damage approach. We're just much more middle of the field and back through the pitcher in our gap-to-gap -gap approach. We think a good swing results in doubles from left center to right center extended. We think a bad swing in this approach with no strikes or one strike results in a pull side ground ball. We want to keep the ball off the ground to the pull side or a lazy fly ball to right field. And this diagram shows our hitters what we're looking for. b hack. This is what we use in our two-strike approach. We cut the field to half again. The external cue is the field of play for our guys. So from second base over to the right field line for a right-handed hitter. This is a no-stride approach. We hit with no strides, with no stride in our two-strike B-hack approach. And the analogy I use is if I were to take a nail and stick it through the ball of your foot, you can lift your heel and load back and load in and hinge at the hip line, you can use your heel to load, but you cannot pick the ball of your foot up off the ground. This helps the hitter uh, relax his, his eyes, see the baseball better, maintain his balance, and make better swing decisions in two-strike counts. 
When we get to 3-2, and this is a big point of emphasis for our program, when we get to 3-2, though, we are no longer in our two-strike approach. We go back to our gap-to-gap approach in a 3-2 count. We believe the 3-2 count is a major chase count for hitters. We want our guys to look for a pitch they can drive in a 3-2 count. We often say the 3-2 count should result in a ball or a barrel. We want them to have the freedom to look for a pitch that they can hit hard. If they strike out on a pitcher's strike, I'm okay with it. I do not want them chasing out of the zone in a 3-2 count. The B-hack swing mechanics also work very, very well for situational hitting. If you have a hitter with a runner at second, nobody out. A hit and run. A runner at third, less than two outs and he needs to be more contact-oriented to get a job done when he gets that opportunity, he can go immediately to his B-hack from the first strike on, and you'll see their success rate go up. This is what B-hack looks like. Kier, one of our best hitters, we're hitting off of a breaking ball, fastball mix here on the field. You can see he's not striding, and he's making his two-strike approach where he's trying to hit the ball hard, to the opposite field gap. Again, we use B-hack for two-strike approach and also situational hitting when we need to get a job done. The next element or the next phase of hitting that we'll talk about is timing. We all know how valuable timing is when it comes to being successful as a hitter. We don't talk about swing mechanics a whole lot because we think proper timing will clean up a lot of swing mechanic issues. Again, Timing for us, a perfectly timed swing results in a line drive off the top bar of the L screen. We believe that timing is broke up into three different phases. Oftentimes when coaches talk about timing, they only talk about their initial move in the swing. But there's three phases in timing. The initial move, when do I want to start my load, my gather, my trigger, whatever you want to call it, whatever terminology you use, we want to start our timing on the break of the pitcher's hands. If we have a hitter that struggles to still get to his best fastball and he's loading when the pitcher is breaking his hands, we will tell that player, when he moves, you move. And when BP is being thrown every day, if I have one of those players, a big mover that has to take a lot of slack out of his body to execute his swing, I'll say, hey, when he moves, you move. And literally, when the BP pitcher starts to move, he'll start loading up. Again, a good way for a hitter with a big movement pattern to be on time. Okay? So, again, we'll go through the three phases. The initial move. You can see Christian Yelich here as the pitcher is breaking his hands. He's loading into the ground, hinging at the hip line. Again, initial move is on the break of the pitcher's hands. And here's some cues that we look for. The forward move. This is the second phase in timing. In my opinion, this is where most hitters get off time is when they move forward. It's not when they move initially. And when I talk to my peers who coach hitters, they, they constantly talk about the initial move. you got to start on time. you got to start on time. A hitter can start on time, but does he move forward on time is the most critical aspect of whether he'll center baseballs or not on a consistent basis. We believe the hitter should move forward when the pitcher's arm moves forward. So as the pitcher gets forward, just like Yelich does here in this clip, we want him getting forward to a balanced athletic position. The last element of timing is rotation, which is when the swing begins. When the front foot hits the ground, the swing should start. This is a video clip we use with a, with a kid in our program who's pretty much 94 to 96. We should see the swing beginning when the ball is meeting the dirt and the grass right there at the front circle of the dirt. Obviously, he's beginning. the hitter is beginning his swing after the ball is past that point and he's late. It results in a fly ball to right. I highly encourage coaches, if you want to talk about timing with your players, get an iPad or your iPhone and film the pitcher and the hitter in the same view, and you can show your hitters all three critical aspects of timing. When are they moving? Does their movement, their initial moves start when the pitcher is breaking his hands? 
Are they getting forward as the pitcher's arm is getting forward? And are they starting their swing when the ball is 8 to 15 feet out in front of them, roughly where the dirt and the grass meet in the circle? Is he starting his swing on time to make hard contact? Environment. Now we're going to talk about how we train our hitters on a daily basis in batting practice, in our mixed BP drill, our angle BP drills, and our double hack attack drills. We hit off the machines quite a good bit. We also mix in coach pitch BP. And this is how I set our field up every day, and I am a stickler about it, okay? We always want to create constraints in the batting practice environment that challenge the hitter to be on time and stay in the middle of the field. So the very first thing we do is we push the batting turtle up as close to the hitter as we can. The way that I check to see that the batting turtle is pushed up far enough is I'll have the hitter take a dry swing, and when he takes a dry swing, if the tip of his bat is about six inches away from the back net or the pad of the batting turtle, that's when it's close enough up to the hitter. We want the bar of the batting turtle to be out over the infield a little bit, okay? And there is a reason for this. We always put our L screen at 25 feet from home plate. So that's another constraint. The batting turtle pushed out, the L screen pushed up. Every swing that we take in batting practice, we we have an over-under concept. We want the ball to be hit over the top bar of the L screen, to the top bar of the L screen, or slightly over, and under the top uh, bar of the batting turtle. That promotes 10 to 15, 10 to 20 degree line drives, gap to gap, which is what we're looking for with our hitters. So push the batting turtle up, push the L screen up, and tell your hitters, hey, I want you to be under the top bar of the L screen and over the top bar of the L screen. And what you'll find is your hitters will find timing. If they're late, they'll hit balls in the top of the cage. If they're late, they'll hit balls lower than the top bar of the L screen. If they're on time, they're going to win the front of the plate more often in line with their stride foot at contact. They're going to hit line drives over the top bar of the L screen and under the top bar of the batting turtle. We do this daily, and it has worked um, very, very well for our guys developing a gap-to-gap line drive approach in our BP um, every single day. This is our angle machine drill. This is what we call onset. Learned this drill years and years ago from Gary Ward, who I think is one of the best hitting minds to ever coach the game, longtime head coach at Oklahoma State. We talked a lot about angle BP Oftentimes, we find coaches want to do the offset angle, which is the opposite field angle, which I'll show next. We believe the onset angle, which is the pull side angle, is much, much more challenging for the hitter and promotes a better bat path that will play in the game than the offset angle. We find a lot of value in the offset opposite field angle, but the pull side front hip onset angle, which is what we call it, that's our terminology, we think is better. It promotes an elite bat path and a connected swing. For you to square this ball up, you have to be connected. Middle to pull side gap is much, much more difficult. How do we set this up? Okay, We set the machine at 36 feet. We pull our cord out to 36 feet, and then we go 6 feet over. 36 feet back from home plate, 6 feet over from the center line is where we put our junior hack attack, and we set it on fastball. You can also throw BP from this angle, or you can flip from this angle if, uh, if, if that's what you'd like to do. But oftentimes, we use the junior hack attack, which we find a lot of value in challenging that hitter because it's a quicker pitch, uh, and he has to react at game speed with his game swing. Onset angle, huge believer in it. We use it every single day. This is our offset angle. This is our opposite field gap angle. You can see here our hitter, he rolls over the first two balls. You can see his swing working east to west being a right-handed hitter. And then he makes an adjustment, and he hammers the ball to straightaway center field. Our external cue and our angle work, whether it's onset or offset, is try to hit a line drive right back through the machine. And you can see right there our hitter 
hits a home run to straightaway center field slightly to the right of the batter's eye, which is a really good swing. The front side must stay closed in the offset angle or the opposite field angle. We believe that we should master this angle first before we move to the onset angle because it's not as difficult for the hitter to hit the ball to the opposite field at that angle. Mix BP. One of the things that we believe in, too, is trying to create an environment in our coach pitch BP, which challenges the hitter. How many times do you take BP on the field and all you hit is fastballs? Well, pitchers in this day and age throw about 50% breaking balls at our level. It's pretty much a 50-50 split, fastball to breaking ball. So we want to make sure that we set our angles in BP and have a breaking ball coming with the fastball in our environment when we do mix BP. So we do a couple things here to try to help mimic the pitcher's angle and also his breaking ball. The first thing we'll do if you watch this video, I got a right-handed BP thrower who's the best in the country, Bradley LaCroix, and this is our left-handed mixed BP drill. So what we're doing here on both of these, if you watch them, is the video on the left, is he is set at a left-handed pitcher's angle. So now the hitter is seeing the fastball angle from the same angle he's going to see in the game. We set in his release window a junior hack attack directly behind him on a left-handed slider. So now that hitter is working on a left-handed angle fastball and a left-handed slider. In the video to the right, we make it even more challenging for a right-hander because we see more right-handed pitching. Here we have the junior hack attack set up directly behind Bradley, and the pitcher, the BP pitcher behind him, or coach or manager, will hold the ball on the ramp of the junior hack attack. The machine is set on a right-handed slider. And we will actually have Bradley throw a pitch and then arm fake, and as his arm is coming through, the coach behind him will slide the ball down the ramp on the slider machine. And now the hitter is in time and synced up with Bradley, who's throwing BP, and then all of a sudden he gets a slider and he's got to make a swing adjustment. This is how we work on mixed BP, left-handed pitcher and right-handed pitcher uh, daily. Double hack attack. We take BP off a double hack attack setup in the cages daily. We leave the machine set up in our cages. We also play our simulated game series off the double hack attack, and it's my favorite drill. One thing I'd like to point out, if you're lucky enough to have two hack attacks, if you order extension legs, you can actually set one machine high, which is a, a more realistic angle, downhill angle for the pitch, and then have one set on low. And what we do is, if you look in the diagram here, is we set the high machine at 55 feet, and we offset that machine a foot and a half from the center of the rubber. Most pitchers, right-handed pitchers, release the baseball at 55 feet at a foot and a half from the center of rubber. Same thing for a left-hander, 55 feet, a foot and a half from the center of the rubber. So all we do is we measure six inches off each edge of the uh, rubber. We go five feet forward and put the machine. So when we set those two machines, those two high machines on those angles, we put the high machine, the back machine, on breaking ball. Then we set the front machine at 52 feet on fastball. Most pitchers will release their fastball lower than they release their breaking ball. This is why the back machine, the high machine, is breaking ball and the front machine is fastball, and we take BP off this setting. Fastball, breaking ball mix, high velocity, typically 88 to 90 miles an hour on the fastball, and roughly 72, 74 miles an hour on the curveball. And now our hitters are seeing the release point of the fastball and the release point of the breaking ball. Another tip that I would give all coaches who like to hit off of the junior hack attacks and the big hack attacks is hitters will oftentimes tell me they struggle to see the baseball. Okay, well, we figured out a way to help our hitters. We take orange neon tape and we take the release points of the machines so that the hitter can see the baseball as soon as it's coming out of the machine. And it makes a huge difference in their ability to see the baseball. Just take orange neon tape and tape the orange rings where the ball comes out of on your machines. They'll see the ball much better. 
This is our double hack attack BP drill. We actually have a jugs machine as well that we really like. And uh, the video is a little tough to see, but you can see the breaking ball is the high machine and behind the fastball. And I just mix fastball to breaking ball. And one of the things we see with our guys, that's a fastball, he's late on it. One of the biggest challenges in this drill is when the front machine at 52 feet is on fastball, and the back machine's at 55 feet, and it's on breaking ball. When you feed the breaking ball and the hitter hits it, if you go back to fastball, oftentimes they'll have a hard time catching up to the fastball. That is a common problem with hitters, but they must be able to get to the pitcher's best fastball. So it's one of the reasons I like the challenge of the double hack attack setup because the hitter has to adjust from the breaking ball timing to the fastball timing uh, just like he will in the game. Another implement and constraint that we use a lot in BP and off of the machines is the barrier wall. We'll set up a barrier wall across our infield just like this, and this is our setup uh, that we'll use from time to time. We don't do barrier wall BP often, but sometimes we will if we feel like our, our hitters are not on time. The barrier wall is a timing constraint, okay? We want the hitter to hit the ball over the screens. It's amazing. When I first saw this drill, I thought they're going to be hitting sky-high fly balls into the outfield. They don't. If they're on time, they'll hit line drive singles into the outfield over these screens. But all it does is it promotes the hitter being on time and hitting line drives at 10 plus degrees, which the screens represent roughly 10 degrees. Okay. We leave the two uh, uh, baselines open so the hitter gets feedback if he hooks a ground ball, which we don't want. But we like the barrier wall as a constraint to promote hitters being on time. And this is our double hack attack sim game in my last slide. This is a left-handed fastball, breaking ball, double hack attack setup. You can see in this drill, we're playing a simulated game. This is nine guys on nine guys. Right-handed hitter goes up there. We put the shift on, put three infielders on one side. Left-handed hitter comes up there. Now we can work on our shifts and our defense as well. And we play baseball off the double hack attacks. If you run out of pitching, Take your hack attacks, set them up on a high-low machine, and play baseball, and, and we can work on all the game uh, situations that we want to in a game environment with velocity and with spin instead of doing the old-school coach pitch sim game where there's a lot of base hits. This makes it much more game-like and much more challenging. So, again, move correctly, approach to hitting, timing and environment in my mind those are the four building blocks to to producing uh, great offensive teams and great offensive players and uh, this is what we do day in and day out week in and week out and thank you so much uh, for having me today it's truly an honor to be here and uh, last slide is my contact information uh, there's my email address and also my cell phone. I provide my cell phone anytime I talk to a group of coaches because I believe you should be able to reach out to me and talk baseball. I'd much more, uh, I'd much prefer talking baseball than sending information by by email. I love to talk baseball. I hope that what I've shown you today is something that you can apply whether you're coaching a B team, a JV team, a varsity team, or a college team. I wanted uh, to provide contact and the information that could help all levels of baseball. And again, thank you so much for having me here today. January 22nd, the presentation will be available in the video library, January 22nd. Absolutely phenomenal, Coach Lee. Thank you so much, man. I heard it when you were recording it here in the office. But, um, you know, not seeing the video and stuff behind it, man, awesome. Hey, we're going to jump right in. Um, you know, we talked to a lot of coaches, a lot of young coaches, a lot of experience, a lot of veteran coaches. And the majority of them say they struggled when they were a young coach. Um, they struggled trying to make everything perfect, trying to teach the mechanic, trying to coach the elbow, trying to coach the hip or the quad. Um, and it seems like everything you presented, removes that thought process. And I know you were going back and forth in the chat with uh, external internal cues, but if you can kind of give us uh, some background on that evolution 
that you experienced as a coach, which brought you to teaching the offensive components the way that you do? Well, I think it's it it it, it sort of goes back. I have to hit rewind a little bit and and take you back to when I was a player, and then from my playing career in college baseball to pro baseball as a as a player, and then when I got into coaching. Um, one of the things that I that that I saw is when I made uh, the transition from high school baseball to college baseball, I was a very low hands, vertical bat, close stance hitter. OK, nobody ever taught me a stance. Uh, nobody ever talked to me about a swing. The best advice I got in high school and I played on a state championship high school team was keep your hands back as long as you can and try to hit a bullet up the middle. And, and that was the extent of my hitting instruction. When I got to college, all the players that I played with said, look, you're never going to hit above average pitching at this level with low hands with a bat that's straight up and down like that. You'll never hit an inside fastball with a closed stance. So immediately, what did I do as a young, naive hitter? I began to make changes to my stance, make changes to my hands, make changes to my swing mechanics, adjusted my swing mechanics to what I thought was going to make me a successful hitter. Well, after falling flat on my face about halfway through my first fall in college baseball, I went back to what I had always done, and I started hitting again. And it taught me a very valuable lesson in that, Hitting is not all about swing mechanics. Um, and the biggest adjustments that I had to make was more approach oriented and external cue oriented in terms of trying to hit the ball to a target. And that's when I really started to feel like the light bulb went off for me as a player and as a coach was any time I began to get too mechanical and too internal with my thoughts as a player and then as a coach, and I'm done talking about me as a player because I don't think that there's a lot of value in that for a coach, quite honestly. But I learned a, a very valuable lesson that I, that I took with me in coaching in that the very first thing you want to try to get the hitter to do is understand you're here for a reason. If you're a good hitter, okay, get athletic, get dynamic, move on time, Pick yourself out of target. For me, the best target in the world is the top bar of the L screen because it's there every day. That L screen's not moving. It's there every day, whether you're feeding a machine, you're flipping, you're throwing BP, whatever the case may be, that top bar of that L screen's not going anywhere. And whether you're an old school guy or a new school guy, if I'm hitting balls that are hitting the top bar of the L screen or just above it, that's about a 10 degree line drive. You're going to get a hit. 80 plus percent of the time, if you do that, your swing pass is going to be really good because it's going to be south to north, a middle approach oriented swing. Um, you're going to be on time. Being in the middle of the field, you're on time. So it cleans up the timing issues, the bat path issues, and it frees the hitter up uh, to be an athlete and take his best swing to the big part of the field. So just a big believer in external cues. And for some guys, that external cue may be a little lower may be a little higher, may be opposite field gap oriented. Uh, you have to, you can use different weapons with external cues to help that hitter. And I, that's why I find so much value in the external cue focus. I think it, it organizes and cleans up a lot of mechanical issues with hitters without talking about mechanics. And yeah, that's one of the thing that stood out about your presentation is um, obviously it was very detailed, well-organized, and, and extremely thorough. But the thing that stood out the most was just the, the removing of thought. You know, it's, it's like instead of trying to hit and be ready for everything, you're just giving them one external cue, like accomplish this, and we are moving in the right direction. Um, and I think part of it, it was just absolutely, uh, it was refreshing to say. And everything did that, your, your approaches. You know, your, your no strike approach, one strike approach or your B swing approach. I mean, you are definitely giving them a specific outline on what they're looking for, what zone they're looking for, where they're trying to hit it. It's removing that element of thought. And um, my question to you is from an approach standpoint, did you ever, uh, when did this come about? How did this all start for you? 
Well, it's like anything else. I think that one thing that I would love to share with all coaches is nobody's going to give you a manual, a how-to manual, and say this is the way, right? You know, you, you, you don't have a manual as an auto mechanic or as a carpenter on this is how to build a house, this is how to fix a car. It's the same way in coaching. We have unbelievable resources at our disposal, but I don't think anything outweighs experience, failure, and growth as a coach over time. It just simply takes time. And I think being a lifelong learner, and I've tried to be a lifelong learner, um, talking to coaches, reading books, watching videos, just being having a growth mindset is, is over time you start to put all those – all those bits of information into that funnel, into that filter. And then you really start to begin to understand how to simplify things to where it makes sense to the player. And that's what I'm really all about. I use the KISS method. I just want to keep it super simple because players love simplicity. And it doesn't have to be incredibly elaborate. It, the environment needs to be challenging because the game is challenging. And but you have to keep your cues as a coach simple and external and one thought process at a time. We want to give the player weapons. That's why we have the damage approach in no in a, in a no strike count. That's why we have the one strike gap the gap. That's why we have the two strike b b hack. And guess what? I've got guys that use their b hack swing and approach. Their hole at bat. I have guys that use a gap to gap approach the whole at bat because the player, once we develop that relationship and he develops that understanding of his swing and, at, and, and his approach and what works for him, a lot of guys will come to me and say, coach, you know, when I'm in my damage approach, my no strike approach, sometimes I, tr I get too big and I overswing. I just need to go to my gap to gap approach. That's, that is becoming your own hitting coach. That's development as a hitter. When, when all I'm doing is just giving them suggestions and basically they're giving me information. I say, you're on the right track. You don't need me anymore. That's that's the role of a coach is to, to get them to the point where they're on hitting coach and they don't need me so much. So how much freedom do you get? And um, I think this question may be more um, relative to the, the class of player you have, freshman versus upperclassmen, but how much freedom do you give them in game to kind of bounce between those those approaches from their B hack to their gap to gap to their do some damage hack? Well, I think it, it, it all boils down to having those conversations in the fall to where when the season starts, the player knows exactly what he's doing when he walks in the box. He understands what his approach is. And, and we all know that the hit, there's that fine line and balance between hitting to the hitter strength and also understanding what you're going to get from the pitcher that day too. It's being able to process both of those and being able to come up with a plan that's going to help you win that day in the box. But a lot of it comes before the season starts. Once the season starts, that player, in my opinion, if I've done my job as a hitting coach, he's prepared to understand when he walks up to the box what weapons he's going to use to help him win at bats and have quality at bats for his team. Awesome, Coach. All right, I've got a bunch of notes here. We've got a bunch of questions here, um, but I really want to start with eye dominance. You mentioned right-handed throwers, right-handed eye dominance, back eye. Um, you know, obviously, uh, obviously being able to see it is very vital to having success and put a swing on it. Um, are you guys actually trying to assess your guys in regards to eye dominance when they get in there? Do they understand that? Um, how deep do you go into it with them? We, 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 we begin with eye dominance right at the beginning of the fall. And I've been doing that since I played. So this is more of a, this, believe it or not, like the eye dominance deal is, is it, it actually helps the player not only track pitches better, but it also cleans up their swing mechanics. And I'll explain why. Um, so we actually, I actually show them how they can check their eye dominance. It's pretty simple. I'll put a baseball, basically hold a baseball up tell them with both eyes open, put their thumb on the baseball. And then shut one eye, open both eyes, shut the other eye. Whichever eye, your thumb stays on the ball is your dominant eye. So what we are trying to get the hitter to understand is this, is if I'm a righty-righty, 
or a lefty lefty. Let's say my back eye is my dominant eye. If my eyes are square to second base in my stance, I'm if I shut my front eye, I can see the bridge of my nose with my rear eye. Well, just think about tracking a breaking ball that's coming at my front shoulder. Yeah. I don't have my dominant eye on the ball. I don't have two level eyes seeing the baseball. So it's going to be harder for me to track pitches into the hitting zone. Another thing that we see too is if if guys' eyes are square to second base if they're a right-handed hitter or to shortstop if they're a left-handed hitter, it moves their front shoulder in. Now their swing is becoming more east-west or west-east or circular versus south to north. If there's a lot of shoulder movement in the swing, they're going to pull off pitches. So if you set the head and the eyes are level to the pitcher, now the shoulders are in line to the pitcher, just like you do when you shoot a bow and arrow or you shoot pull or you shoot a rifle. Now my swing is much more clean and direct to the baseball. It helps with your swing mechanics as well. Now, have you found any parallels between uh, cross-eye dominance, for example, right-handed hitter, left-eye dominant? Do they do they see the ball a little bit better in your experience? Uh, is there any parallels between success at the collegiate level? Well, there's a reason why uh, you see a lot of guys that are left-handed hitters, right-handed throwers that hit for a high average. A lot of it is because their front side is their dominant side in their swing. Those guys, that that type of set typically is a guy that can keep the bat, has better bat the ball skill and also stays through the zone better. Those guys typically uh, stride into the plate and stay closed a little bit longer. Now, whether that has anything to do with eye dominance or not, I don't know. I have seen guys who are righty-righties especially. They tend to, to step in the bucket a little bit more because I think their backside wants to dominate in the swing, but I also think there's some things with depth perception and tracking pitches. Their, their, their head wants to open up so we can see the baseball. So one of the things that we do sometimes with guys is their back eye dominant, we'll have them stand in a slightly open stance so that they can stride back into the plate. Uh, so sometimes I'll do that with a right-handed, a right-handed hitter who's righty-righty. We'll have them slant, stand slightly open or lefty-lefty simply because they can see the ball better. Uh, and you tend to see guys that step in the bucket, not always. You know, there's always outliers, but typically righty-righties will step in the bucket some simply because I think they're trying to see the baseball and their backside wants to uh, wants to dominate their swing. Awesome, Coach. I can stay on this vision track forever, and it's, uh, we, we've got to move on to some of our, our members' submitted questions, but uh, thank you for sharing. Um, I'll, I'll kind of rattle off a couple of quick ones. Where can we find that 3838 heavy uh, heavy bat mentioned by coach? It's coming from Diego Gonzalez from Cadets Player Development Academy. Yeah, um, I get them from a company called Big Time Bat. They're not expensive at all. Uh, they have a black 3636, a red 3838, and a big blue, which we use a lot of, which is a 4040. Awesome. Um, Ronnie... Joan Say from Gregory, Gregory Portland High School in Texas wants to know about the dials you put your junior hack attack on uh, when you do the uh, onset offset BP. Great question because it's very, very important. I'll tell everybody on the call, if you're using a big hack attack, we use TrackMan to dial in the settings of the spin rate of the machines. So we typically will go 668 for a fastball at 55 feet with a big hack attack. With a junior hack attack, we put it on seven and a half, seven and a half, ten at 36 feet, which is the fastball setting. So um, you can dial it back if you got high school kids or if we're just introducing the drill for the first time with the junior hack attack, we may go six, six, nine or six, six, ten. But oftentimes we, we throw them right into the fire, seven and a half, seven and a half, ten, which is the fastball setting on the junior hack attack. That's awesome, Coach. And to the coaches listening in, I just want to point out that, that the head coach at Clemson knows exactly what settings his pitching machines are at. I think that that's just absolutely remarkable. Um, awesome. Um, this next question comes from uh, Shane Marshall from Central Valley Christian High School. Um, a lot of coaches preach a complete philosophy of staying on the fastball, some even with two strikes. What's your approach to the breaking ball, especially in regards to timing with and without two strikes? And we've got about five minutes left before we got to cut it off, Coach. 
Yeah, this is a great question. I'm, I'm a big believer in always being on time to his best fastball, but I also think, especially with two strikes or with runners in scoring position, because pitchers, as we all know, tend to spend the ball a little bit more, especially if they got a good breaking ball with runners in scoring position and in two strike counts. If you, I'm a, I, I like sitting slider speed, but I think you have to train that. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot to answer your question is we have a cage set up, the double hack attack cage, where we'll have righty fastball, breaking ball, lefty fastball, breaking ball. We'll put it on slider or curveball, have guys use their B hack, their two strike approach swing, and hit like handed breaking balls. So a left handed hitter will hit left handed breaking balls, right handed hitter will hit a right handed breaking ball, the ball breaking away from them. Because in two strike counts, typically that's going to be the toughest pitch for that hitter to be able to compete with. So I think if you want uh, to do anything, sometimes uh, you can sit on slider speed with two strikes, but you got to train it. It's one you can, and we all fall victim to that. We don't train enough off of hitting spin. It's one of the things, even in our program, we need to do more of is try to hit as much spin as possible. Because as we all know from the big leagues down, um, it's more of a 50 50 fastball to breaking ball split. Awesome, Coach. Well, we got another three minutes or so. I'm going to try to fit one more in. And okay. I think I think you may have answered this question in your presentation, but not specifically. So I just wanted to bring it up. Um, comes from Matt Kelly at St. Thomas Academy in Minnesota. Um, you know, he, he references the long ball in today's game and launch angle and how it's become a focal point. And I know you guys love to mash down there. But um, he references that, you know, high school players don't always have the control or the size and discipline to focus that much on law and launch angle. Um, so how do you communicate good mechanics that support solid contact without compromising strength and power? And how would you change that approach for younger hitters? Yeah, launch angle is so misunderstood. I mean, a lot of people get so ramped up and crazy on hitting Twitter about launch angle. Launch angle is not a swing. OK, launch angle is a post contact result. OK, so it's really simple on what we do in terms of launch angle. We know that if a hitter hits a ball from 10 to 15 degrees, they're going to get a hit 80 plus percent of the time. In the big leagues, they get a hit like 70 plus percent of the time if the ball's hit from 10 to 15 degrees. OK, so all we do is we put a yellow rope at 10 degrees in our cages and it's our external cue. Just try to hit a line drive off the yellow rope. That's 10 degrees. All it is is a line drive into the outfield. That's it. That's the extent in which we go uh, with launch angle. We don't talk about launch angle a whole lot. We actually use the 10 degree line as an external cue. Try to hit a ball to that line. You're hitting a 10 degree line drive. That's a hard single, double, um, straight away into the middle of the field. It's really that simple for us. It's awesome, Coach. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, gentlemen, obviously, we could sit on here all day and talk hitting with Coach Lee. I just wanted to let you know I have locked him down to host a Barnstormers event. As soon as this COVID thing breaks, we're going to be down in Clemson. Um, so look for that hopefully coming this fall. And yeah, we'll be videotaping it as well. Um, next speaker coming up is going to be Tim Nyman. Uh, he'll start at 515. And um, yeah, definitely join us back for that. But Coach Lee, I want to thank you for your time and, and all your effort. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you, guys.